Okay. Board of Commissioners, we will call this work session to order this morning, and thank you for being here. Today is Monday, March 16, uh, 2020, and we're so glad that you're here, and also would like to thank the citizens of Douglas County, the ones that are here with us this morning, and also the ones viewing uh, by television or our, uh, your technology apparatuses. Um, before we start this morning, Board of Commissioners, I want to take the time and to declare an emergency. As we all are aware, we are dealing with COVID-19, which is coronavirus, and we are in pandemic mode. So I, therefore, I will start off uh, reading this declaration of emergency. Whereas Douglas County, Georgia, has experienced an event of critical significance as a result of COVID-19, the novel coronavirus during the month of March, and whereas, in the judgment of the chairman, of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners with advice from the Douglas County Emergency Management, uh, Emergency Management Agency. There exist emergency circumstances located in Douglas County requiring extraordinary and immediate corrective actions for the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Douglas County, including individuals with household pets and service animals, and whereas to prevent and or minimize injury to people and damage to property resulting from this event, the measures described below will be enacted. Now, therefore, pursuant to the authority vested in me by local and state law, it is hereby declared that a local state of emergency exists and shall continue until the conditions requiring the declaration are abated. Wherefore, it is ordered that the Douglas County Emergency Management Agency activate the emergency operations plan. Number two, that the following sections of the Douglas County Code be implemented. Section 774, which is authority to waive procedures and fee structures and section 77-5, uh, and that deals with overcharging and price gouging. So it be declared this day, um, this uh, 16th day of March, 2020, at 10, it is now 10.05, we are, uh, I am declaring a state of an emergency here in Douglas County. Thank you, Douglas County citizens. Board of Commissioners, before we start the meeting, I wanted to take the time to say that this meeting will be a little unusual. It will not be our typical work session. We will have no public comments this morning uh, due to our extenuated waiting circumstances. We have a global crisis, and it will uh, certainly be disrespectful this morning to just keep talking and rambling. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that we abide and uh, adhere to social distancing. That's very, very important and the uh, CDC and public health officials are just advising that we do so. Before I start, I, um, I, we have Jason Milholland, our director of EMS, will be uh, providing an, uh, just an update today, but I just wanted to just uh, kick off by saying thank you, Board of Commissioners, and good morning again. Uh, today we have over 99 cases of cor uh, coronavirus identified in various counties in Georgia. I want to assure the citizens of Douglas County this administration is working intensively with all of our partners at the local, state, and federal level. We are communicating around the clock with our public health officials and epidemiologists to activate unprecedented precautionary measures to mitigate and educate our citizens about the COVID-19. Uh, Testing is available in all 50 states now, which is a positive thing. In light of the cor uh, coronavirus pandemic, it is important for us to take aggressive steps to flatten the curve of exposure, risk, and transmission, which requires social distant, distant behaviors. Social distancing measures are essential components of public health response to the pandemics, such as the flu. So we just want to uh, just use those same pr principles. The objective, objectives of this mitigation measures is to reduce transmission, thereby delaying the epidemic uh, peak and spreading cases over a longer time to relieve pressure on the healthcare system. Evidence-based practices of social distancing uh, includes isolating, uh, contact tracing, quarantine, uh, exposing person, uh, persons to school closures, workplace measures and closures, workplace uh, avoiding um, crowding, and also it's, it supports the effectiveness, effectiveness of measures obtained largely from observational studies and simulational studies. 
voluntary isolation is feasible, and that's just basically primarily staying in your own home. Our older adults and people have severe underlying chronic, um, with older adults and people who have severe underlying chronic medical conditions like heart and lung disease and diabetes seem to be at a higher risk of developing serious complications for, from COVID-19. The efficacy of social distancing has, uh, distancing has proven effective, and we have started this process, particularly with our vulnerable populations. We want to wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. Hand sanitizer is acceptable, but we per the preference is washing your hands for that 20 second period. But if you uh, are using the hand, hand sanitizer, please make sure it has at least 60% alcohol base. Refrain from shaking hands and hugging, uh, coughing your elbows, maintain at least, at least a six feet distance. Blow your nose and your tissues, discard used tissues. Stay at home if you're sick. Under the Spalding classification, clean surfaces, which is semi-critical, critical, critical, and non-critical. We want you to use those uh, Clorox wipes and uh, Lysol wipes. With, uh, with no further ado, I will ask our uh, director, Mill Holland, to come up and provide a presentation this morning. And his presentation will be on the wings of CDC and the state and public health officials' recommendations. Uh, thank you, Director Mill Holland. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jason Mill, Douglas County Emergency Management Director. And I just want to go over a few things and try to keep this sh uh, kind of short as possible because I know you have, may have some questions and we can kind of go, go from there. Um, go from there. Mainly, we're encouraging citizens and employees to continue monitoring public health and CDC website. They update this information on a regular basis. So if you may read it Friday, it, there's things that are going to change over time. So just keep going back to those websites and go to websites that are scientific-based and stuff like that to get your information. That's what I'm really asking is, is verify your information as you get it. There's all kind of different theories and everything like that. Just try, try to go to the known experts and you know, make proper decisions based on that guidance. Um, you'll continue to see conversations about social distancing and flattening the curve. You know, flattening the curve is we're trying to spread things out and not have a, a, a spike and overwhelm uh, services and things like that. So we're trying, uh, that's what they're, you'll hear more of that. So look, uh, look into that a little bit more and so you understand because I'm seeing it more and more. We've always talked about it in kind of um, previous public health emergencies and some planning and stuff like that. Uh, what you don't want is everybody getting sick at one time and overwhelming your systems. So that, you know, trying to get that and the social distancing practices and things help um, he help with that a good bit. So just um, just kind of educate yourself on that. There's plenty of information out there on the, that right now, but uh, it, is, um, it is valid information if you get it from the correct source, of course. You'll, um, one thing I want to say is um, you'll continue, continue to see numbers rise um, because we're doing more testing. If you're not testing for something, you're not going to find it. Once you start testing, you'll see numbers. That, and so don't let it alarm you. Say, oh, Lord, we didn't have any today, but we got this many. So as they test more people, you'll see the numbers go, go up. And there's just no way around that. So just understand that and understand why it's happening is because the, as the testing increases, you're going to find more cases. I mean, it's just simple as that. And I, I know some in other areas that were getting real concerned about the immediate spikes. And it was because the um, testings that, that were being implemented. Um, as uh, as of this, the latest numbers I have for Georgia, 119 is the the most current um, one. Before I, I mm -hmm. checked right before it's, I get, came in, mm -hmm. so like I said, that was um, last night. It was 111. So you'll see, you like I say, you when they they'll update again today at noon. So and, and expect to see that number get high, um, higher at noon. So and we'll try to keep them. Uh, we've been um, if you're. Fine. Uh, we've we've put out the that website from public um, Cobb Douglas um, Public Health on the, their numbers. They got a little dashboard, Department of Public Health, um, where you can see as they update it, you can see what the current numbers are in, in the counties. We have had no positive tests in Douglas County yet. But remember that will change. I, there's no way around it. So don't don't think we're the, there's nobody in Douglas County with it. There's just no positive test back for Douglas County. So so just remember that. Um, as Madam Chair said, uh, I'm most concerned about the elderly and uh, those with underlying health conditions. 
That's and that's who this and there's there'll be exceptions to the rule. You'll hear about a young person, whatever having serious complications, and everything. Those are kind of exceptions to the uh, rule. The main people having serious problems are the ones with those underlying health conditions and are elderly. I'm seeing positive things. Um, my parents are elderly, and they're, I'm very concerned about them going being able to go to the grocery store. Their young neighbors have offered to go get their groceries for them, things like that. People are stepping up neighbors. Government can't solve everything, but us taking care of our neighbors and doing things like that, that speaks a lot, and that's what our society needs to do is take care of those that we want to protect the most. And another thing is if you're sick, don't go to work with a fever and stuff like that. Know the difference between an allergy and what an allergy is and what the, the symptoms that they were putting out, the public health was putting out about the COVID. But we do not want to, um, um, like I said, we want to flatten the curve as much as possible. Right now, um, public health, uh, I mean, a price gouging report should be going to the Governor's Office of um, Public Affairs. Their number is 404-656-3790. They, um, they will investigate this. We do not want to see people. That was part of the, uh, the Madam Chair's declaration for the county. Is one, one, of that, um, one of the things we wanted to implement. You know, our, our county um, state of emergency is kind of broad. You can do all kind of different things on that. We want to be limited and, and do our correct response. We don't go overboard and start doing things like, you know, some of the measures in there until it's absolutely necessary. We want to take proper steps, not overboard steps, but we want to, um, but we don't want to be non-responsive either. So these measures, uh, we can always add, we can always add to it. And if we need to change something, we can take something out. It's fluid and we, at, at the board's pleasure, we can change it on recommendations. Um, based on um, what information we're given. And with that, I'll, I'll try to answer any questions. I just want to hit those few high points, and I think we've all got plenty of information now from, if you turn on the TV, you'll hear everything, so I don't want to just keep repeating everything that you're hearing nonstop on the media, but I wanted to be, make myself available if you had questions. Director, if you could just speak to some of the things that has already been done here in Douglas County in terms of closing our senior services. Uh, yeah, the, the senior services is one of the first things we started talking about because of that, that population. Having the, our uh, senior citizens come gather together for their activities is probably not a good idea. You saw what happened in the state of Washington with a nursing home. That's how quickly it can spread and go through. That's why their numbers are so high. That nursing home really spiked and it spiked with the, um, the responders also. So that. Uh, so in those um, and following along with the, with the schools closing, where would uh, if we did not uh, do something with the libraries, where would all those stu uh, students go? They would they would be having makeshift classes at the library, and the same thing of the group activities um, uh, anywhere. So we tried to, um, as Madam Chair and I spoke and we, we talked about trying to look at those places where we to limit those groups getting together because. Uh, you saw the guidance last night from the CDC changed to 50 now. Mm -hmm, that's and not, not everybody's following, quite following that because that's really restrictive. Mm -hmm. But that's their recommend. That's their recommendation. We had to do, take things by case by case on that. So um, that um, th those are main. And we also, our uh, we we spoke Friday about our citizens who participate in the community service board. Those activities you have maybe not have the elderly population there, but you have people with a lot of underlying health issues because of their, uh, dis their the disabilities that go along with that. And I, like, that, those are the, um, and like, like I said, I'm trying to think of any, uh, trying to go through, those are the main ones. Um, so, and of course the courts have done their stuff with the judicial, they, they have a different system and everything than we do. Courts in the constitutional, they have their court states of emergencies and they're, they're based on orders from the judge and recommendations from the state bring court justice. That's what okay. it is. I want to re reiterate that uh, for senior services, we do have uh, some services available to our seniors, which is um, Meals on Wheels, yes. um, medical transport, and also homemaker services, which when we go in um, and clean their homes. So that services is still available to the citizens, so we want to make that very clear that you will still uh, receive your Meals on Wheels and uh, your medical transport is available and also your homemaker, serv homemaker services. But our parks right now, uh, certainly I have to lay, just kind of yield to my um, background, medical background in eight years, uh, nine years actually, clinical surgery. Um, everything is wiped down. Please, I encourage you to continue to wipe down your surfaces, uh, even in your homes, your refrigerator, your stove, just little things that you touch, anything you touch, any type of stainless steel surfaces. Your telephones, that's very important that we keep your phones clean. And then, um, 
we just want to, again, like I said, protect our seniors. That's so important, and that social distancing. And if, um, if I could add, uh, uh, Director, certainly Friday, social distancing wasn't really a hot topic. It hit really Saturday when that really, you know, really, it was already being discussed, but I, I saw some, uh, some elevation of that topic on Saturday. What did, did you see the same? Or yeah, you, it's based on, everybody's based on what they get on, on like so luckily on the CDC web, they're, they're, they're checking that CDC website, looking at the get, um, de, um, guidelines and trying to implement those measures. Yeah. So we're basing like say we're not jumping the gun on anything, we're following recommendations um, from, from the health professional. I'm not a health professional. Yes. You know, I, I try to overall and support manage events and get information out you know, through, and, um, uh, through, through, but I am not a medical professional. Yes, uh, we we I sit on the uh, public health board. Um, one of the board of directors there as well. So we're, I'm, I'm in very close contact, the same as you, uh, Director Neil Holland, with uh, Lisa Crossman and Dr. Mimar, and uh, CDC and all. We have in fact a, a, a meeting in a little bit today. Me and yourself. Um, I believe with the governor's office just to talk about some other things that are happening. But I wanted to assure our citizens that um, I think at the moment, uh, even with my uh, cabinet, some questions about uh, are we, uh, when I said no congregation in the library, I just know the uh, human nature. Our children are out of school, so they will congregate in those libraries, and I want to keep that social distancing down. And the teachers are pivoting and working with, you know, we all, we didn't always have computers. They just may have to write some reports of things of that sort, but we just want to make sure that we don't have a lot of exposure. So I, my statement to my cabinet was I'm not um, certainly reactive. I'm very proactive and very aggressive uh, when it's dealing with things such as viruses and things that I've been exposed to in the past. This is not our first pandemic in the United States, but certainly we all want to work together, uh, pay close attention to just the protocols that are out there. Two things that we've done, uh, we have a per, uh, public service announcement that's uh, being rolled out by our communications department. Rick Martin and his team uh, pulled together a uh, public service announcement uh, this past Friday. You should start seeing that public service announcement hit cable TV. I believe we have about 55 channels. And if you could, um, Director of Communications, could you come up and talk about some of the things that we've done for your PSA? I just want to make sure the citizens are aware. Madam Chair, while Jason's there, can I add one thing? To yes, you? yes. Uh, so, so the public's aware, just so we're clear about what we're doing. You, uh, by declaring an emergency, have activated the Douglas County Emergency Management uh, Agency Operation Plan. Two, you have implemented the following section, 7.7-4, which is authority waive procedures and fee structures, mm -hmm. and also 7.7-5 overcharging. overcharging. Uh, at my recommendation, I would add to it, that section based on the closed areas or any kind of restricted areas. We've held out that 7.7-7 uh, at Jason's request, but if we're going to utilize that section to close parks or eliminate uh, gathering and have restricted areas, I recommend that that be added to the declaration of emergency while we're here today. I guess the point of all this is if we put that in, we've not imp we've not put in every potential uh, waiver because we want to take graduated steps based upon the needs. As you know from talking to me yesterday and Jason and I talked yesterday and mm -hmm. Jennifer Moore and I talked yesterday, uh, if we're going to have restricted areas, I think we need 7.7-7 in that declaration, staff will get that ginned up and we'll get it filed with the clerk because it has to be filed with the clerk in accordance with the ordinance. But I just wanted to make sure that that was understood. Jason, if we're gonna have restricted areas, I think that has to be implemented in this to give the chairman authority to designate restricted areas. I just, wanted to, I just didn't want to get related to the public. My concern was related to the public that we're gonna start saying you can't come out of your house after eight o'clock or something like yeah. that. That's Which what we, I wanted to avoid. I, I avoid, avoid it all costs. Well, we're on TV right now, Sam. We're not saying that. Okay, I'm just, I just, but we I, do need if we're going to close parks or if we're going to have restricted areas, we do need that section implemented as part of the emergency plan. Like okay. I said, just, I just ask that you know it be me measured. I'm not a politician or a lawyer, but uh, I do understand people you know, getting concerned about restrictive movement. I try to be very aware of their feelings and their concerns about things like that and how that that looks and that, uh, what, what that means. So that's. My hesitations on sure. that. So we'll add it, and it will be in there, Madam Chair, for when you uh, do sign, if you so 
desire. Yeah. I think the point of what Jason's saying, the state's saying, and everybody else is saying, let's don't panic. Right. Let's take absolutely. it one step at a time. We get home. through this. Yes, absolutely. And that's yeah. the purpose. Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. Commissioner Geiger. Okay, thank you. Um, when I came by the mall yesterday, it was open and it was packed. Is this going to impa uh, impact some places like the mall where people, they don't, they're not, Clustered together, but they're touching. As of this, the as this point, they're not recommend. Uh, that may change later on, but right now they're not. Um, I actually went by Friday because I had a meeting with the mall manager to discuss some issues, uh -huh. and and they were doing an extremely good job on cleaning. They had an, an, an a, everywhere you look, they had a staff cleaning and stuff like that. And I did not, you know, but I, I was not there on the weekend. I was at work on the weekend, so I was not at the mall on the week. Um, um, but I, so I don't know how many. But I think as long as we're, we're trying to avoid this that tight cluster of, of, of people together is what they're, and right now there's no recommendations that I've seen come from public health or CDC to, uh, for, to um, like, like our fire code, there's no more, so many people in there. The more spread out you can be, and you have to take um, responsibility for yourself too. If you see a lot of people in there, I would avoid it. I wouldn't go, if there's a pack, big pack room, I'm, I'm not going in there. I mean, but well, so you have uh, to, are the we have recommendations. Are the theaters gonna be closed? I'm sorry? At the mall? Are the theaters? Going to be closed at the mall. Um, that, um, that they've not been given that guideline. Um, they've not been, not that I know the theater as far as I know is not closed, but um, from what I'm understanding, people are doing that self awareness of if they do go separating themselves from it. But there's no ordinance, I mean, there's no state law or anything like that has changed um, or telling them to close down. Of course, there's um, business are taking, some business are taking proactive measures and that and I, I do and what I, you know be honest I'm, I'm concerned about are some of our small business folks this is their livelihood this is a this sure. is a public health emergency mm -hmm. but I'm also worried about our um, people that are trying to make a living too trying mm -hmm. trying to have this measure response is difficult the the greater good and and taking care of making sure that we don't put somebody out of their house because we've taken a measure that's that's too much too confining and yeah. so and so I, that's, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, it's that fine line to work, and, it, and it's difficult. And, but I'm also very aware that people need their, people need their jobs, and people need their businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay, I yield back. I was just asking about the mall. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Gutt. <coughs> Any other court questions? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And I just want to acknowledge my full support with your declaration. Um, we're in an unprecedented time. Um, Jason, you know, back in 2009, uh, we went through that flood that was sort of isolated, right? We had um, probably the most casualties out of, between us and Cobb, but yet um, it was isolated. Uh, isolated. This is nationwide. This is the entire state. And I appreciate what efforts you're having to go through to prepare for it. Madam Chair, I appreciate you being at the leadership helm at this moment, uh, preparing the county for what we call pre-op. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, it, it's that time where we're just preparing ourselves over the next couple of weeks at a minimum. Um, as we get further guidance from on top on how we go about doing this, um, I think it is important to pay attention. I'll say again, you gotta pay attention um, Jason, thank you for um, being succinct on um, information, um, original sources, no propaganda, get the original source, and we all consistently follow that source. That being said, um, there's two steps to the process I just want to ask, a, a couple, some citizens have been asking, but I had no information until I get information. Um, it, it's, it's, this is not a time, this is academic, this is clinical. <laughs> this is not time to, to, to play. So my question is regarding, we're moving into what's called uh, perhaps a testing, and then once you get beyond testing, there's quarantine, and we move on. Help me understand, and for the, the public, and take your time, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, from a testing perspective, and I, I, I do understand that they're setting up these testing shops, uh, or areas, I don't wanna use the wrong word, testing areas throughout the state. Uh, and that being said, has one, has Douglas County been um, identified as a testing area, um, or start with that, 
Okay. Uh, go ahead. I'll go ahead. And get, I'll go ahead and get it. Yes. Right now, no. Um, there's an area. There's some area. They're working on some areas in Cobb County because if you look at the numbers, yes. Cobb County has 20 something low 20s. I'd have to look at the just off my low 20s. Um, so that's where they're going to start popping the mm -hmm. testing up first. Okay. And there'll be measures because you got to remember that you have to staff. You can't just open them. They got to be staffed. There's a limited number of people that can do you know, can run these and. Previously, one of the biggest problems on some of the testing was not only the availability of testing, but the limited people that could run the test. Started out with just CDC, then it went for the state lab in the CDC. Now some of the private labs are, are getting opened up to testing. So that was the first hurdle. Now you have, okay, you know, uh, when they open up these, um, some people are calling drive-through testing sites that mm -hmm. you've seen on television. Uh, as they open this, there's on, there's only so, so many of those folks that can do that. So they're, going to, they're trying to strategically um, figure out where to place those based on the, on the greatest need. So that, that may expand later, but as of right now, Douglas County has not been mentioned. Okay, all right, that's tight enough. Uh, so th there's the testing phase, but when you think about emergency, the point is um, um, anticipatory. Mm -hmm. What happens if you do have to scale? Uh, so you've answered that, that perhaps um, you know, at the local level, if there was a need, um, could we respond? Um, it sounds like the private sector will be participating in this process, um, but so, but that's okay. Now I'm going to move. I'm going to shift now into quarantine, and I guess it, that will follow as well with the testing. Perhaps, uh, what happens when the hospital beds are full? Um, now you move to the next layer of where can you quarantine people? I mean, obviously we've got a nice jail sitting over there, but. Um, you know, I was talking to Commissioner Mitchell, he says, well, think MASH, think parks, think mm -hmm. put those institutional things up. What would we do if it gets there? And it's just, I need to understand we, what we, is the we emergency feel, plan. Um, the state would be taking the lead on, on, on larger, like, like, have you seen where they have the, as uh, I keep thinking of the county, it's called the Hard Labor State Park, where they had that, um, that's where they're, uh, for people that have nowhere else to go. Right. And stuff like that. And that, so that's a measure we'd support uh, as of now. And they'll help us scale that as, as, ne as needed. The majority of folks right now are being able to self-quarantine at home, and those with serious medical conditions uh, are doing the hospitals. And so that, but they, um, but the a lot of that is the quarantine, like at the heart of the state park, is more people that, okay, well, may not be too sick, or we want to ask, we want to get that person away from everybody else and stuff like that, and make them as comfortable as possible. Okay, all right, and, and very good. And so to, to that point, what's also some. Sometimes you have to figure out what we won't do. Um, as we know that we as a commission are a subdivision of the state, right? We know that um, the president declared what national emergency went on Thursday. The governor did it on what, Saturday? We're doing it today on Monday in the succinct order. Um, so I understand that the state is driving this. So it's less pressure on us per se to have to, when people ask the question, well, what is our plan? Well, our plan is gonna line up whatever the state says it's going to be. Um, and so is that an accurate statement? Yes, uh, they're, they're the lead. I mean, it's always been, we, um, for when I first got in, transferred from law enforcement into emergency management, yes. we, were, we were all, you know, we were really concerned about a, a pandemic flu. Mm -hmm. This virus is, uh, has some similarities on, on the, luckily it does not have the death toll that the 1918, 1919 pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, that, that flu. You know, there's different strains, influenza and stuff like that. We're not dealing with something on that level, but that's what we were always worried about coming up and priorities changed over time. And so unfortunately, some of the people that were big in that, they're, they're retired now because that was for many years. And some of those people are being kind of brought back in for their institutional knowledge and, tw and tweak it and go back over the all the pandemic flu plans that we've done for the last 15, 20 years and, and, and trying to say, okay, because we got to, we got to get a lot of work, a lot of time was put in those plans. So they're tw tweaking those plans to make it valid for what, what we're dealing, currently dealing with. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And my last question deals with obviously money. Uh, and so um, uh, Ken or Madam Chair or the Director of Finance all pay, pay, somewhat pay attention, which is not aware in emergency mode and, and Madam Chair has the authority to do what she needs to do by way of spending according to our purchasing. My, my question is to Director Hallman to make sure that we're keeping up with this in a separate way, 
Um, the money that needs to be spent, you got to go, whatever is necessary. But make sure we, we, we segregate that from our normal operations, recognizing how it's going to come. Um, how will that affect? Is there any federal money that's coming down? And Madam Chair, I'll yield to you to ask you, have you been talking to the state at all or the feds, Madam Chair, and, and that what relief will we get or support? Relief is wrong. Support that we get directly for, for expenses that we're incurring, real cash, that we may have to incur to keep things going. Can you speak to that, Madam Chair, please? Certainly there's some, um, some um, opportunities from FEMA and GEMA, but uh, also I just received a call this past weekend from our Representative Bruce indicating there potentially will be some additional funding coming down from the federal level, and he just kind of wanted us to throw a ballpark figure out there. So I just kind of gave him something soft, maybe $1.8 to $2 million, and that's, that's offline, not um, based on your GEMA and FEMA uh, funding. But those discussions, I'm not sure if, uh, have taken place yet, but he wanted to have something in his in his uh, pipe so he could at least uh, at least give that information to the governor's office this morning. All right, I'll, I'll talk a little bit. I don't want to get too technical on this. What we have in the, on the federal level, we have a Stafford Act, okay. and they're enacted parts of the Stafford Act that um, that can um, do some resources, but it's very measured and it's dependent on how much money they release and how they release mm -hmm. and which sections. So it's kind of like our ordinance, uh, emergency ordinance. So we're not real clear on that. Hopefully, we're going to get some more clarifications later today on which parts are, uh, have actually been enacted, because this is different than what we normally deal with. Like if this was a tornado, flood, whatever, I can tell you how, how the money flows. It's you know 75% federal, usually 15% uh, state, and 10% and, uh, and local, 10% state, 15% local. But I'm not saying that is on this. This is a different, this, they're doing this differently. I'm basing this on, and I'm not saying that's what's gonna happen, it depends on how they flow, how they write this at the federal level and state level, and how it's going to pass through us. So I cannot guarantee anything till we get that total guidance, and it'll be strict. It, they'll be strict because normal disasters happen in, a, in, in six, seven, eight counties in the state. Mm -hmm. This is you're talking about the entire country. There's the sustainability to do what is done in normal disasters. I don't think there's that much money. You know, this is just me speaking as a citizen and my experience with how disaster, the, the funding of disasters, I don't think that's sustainable for the country to do what we've done on um, the, the, the disa disasters. The, you know, you do the math. If we, you know, if you think we, this may cost the county $2 million, you multiply that by every county and across the country. You see what I'm saying? That you, that's, so I, that's why the funding of uh, the funding stuff is, is being very carefully looked at because there there is a limit to money, so I just want to caution on, on that. So don't I want to say what we normally do and what this is this is going to be a little bit different, and we're all kind of waiting to see how this is going to play out. Because right. there's nothing firm, um, director. I just want to make that very clear. This okay. is just if someone. Okay, just, I, I just want to make sure everybody was clear. Yeah, to think, think about the numbers. The wall. I said number one, we don't have any um, benchmarking uh, data available. Uh, this is uh, certainly a typical uh, situation, so I made that very, you know, that was made very clear to me. It's just to give me an idea of what you think. I yeah. said, man, we don't have any history trends or anything of this sort. This and is. I, I just want to, I just want to be able to caution because a lot of people are used to it. I think during the oh, 2009 okay. floods, I think Douglas County got seven, eight million dollars back from the feds um, yes. through the state uh, in in GEMA, but this that was a limited thing. Right. Right. This this is a lot wider spread than anything we've seen before like this. So I just want to, I don't want to, there be unrealistic expectations. Mm -hmm. That's what I just want to caution about. I'm caution on spending and stuff like that. Not this jurisdiction, but a lot, some people, and uh, my experience with emergency managers across the country, they think once they get a declaration, it's a free for all for spending and not measured spending. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, every, every county in the, across the, the United States is going to have to really uh, look at their, their, their spending and make sure that what they spend is um, is definitely need. You know what I'm saying? Uh, what well, I know, I like to say, that's just my. I'll stop there. You know, you see what I'm saying? Yes. I'll stop there. Yes, <laughs> I understand. Everything is measured and calculated yes. at this point. Simple because we have a wide net. net yes, to and cast. it's a limited, limited, yeah, and it's and limited resources resource. based on population. There's a lot going on at this point, but I do uh, want to just. I, I feel encouraged if uh, our citizens just. Uh, uh, follow the lead of CDC and also our public health officials and do the right thing by making sure that we adhere to all the, um, the recommendations that have been, been made. 
uh, I think I, I, I want to feel optimistic even in, the, in a pessimistic uh, situation, and I want everyone to stay calm, but at the same time be uh, very uh, astute and then uh, aware of your surroundings and things that we need to do. So I want you to be a, an enforcer, but at the same time uh, to just stay calm. And that's the message that I've been given, not only just from just me saying that, but the public health officials just said we want our citizens to, to stay calm because if we don't uh, stay calm, we can't think things through. So uh, right now, everything, hygiene, hygiene, hygiene is important. Uh, anything Chair, else? I want to okay. just finish my uh -huh. I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, that's okay. Keep no, no. Going. last, last it's related to the money. So mm -hmm. we, we recognize and duly noted on um, the federal park, uh, the, the county also has its own operations. Mm -hmm. um, our operations are obviously tied to the, uh, the local economy. And I appreciate your sentiments um, about overreach of government. Uh, but yet this is a national crisis. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a balancing act. Um, there will be impact. <laughs> We don't know what that impact is, and we can't get ahead of it. But at the same time, we will talk about it during our finance committee and what we do to monitor um, our local economy and how things are going to. Um, it, you can anticipate certain areas that will be impacted. Um, for example, I'll be meeting with our um, hotel um, 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 industry uh, colleagues um, later today uh, to understand. You know, we've got what six or seven hotels that we know directly through open, doesn't take rocket science, know that they're impacted. What does that mean for them? So there is a certain work that we still have to do as commissioners to, to, to be more anticipatory. Uh, what does it mean for the things that we currently have in play? Uh, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, I, I've had talk, have conversations with our, our um, I want to call our, our capital markets colleagues and stuff and, and giving us some insight into how uh, the broader economy and the market is going. And it's trying to hold. You see the incentives that are being put in place. Uh, and so it's something that we have no control over that. That's, that. That'll come from on high, but we have to give assurances. So to your point, um, life must go on. There, there is mobility that will happen. It's just use discretion. Use, to Madam Chair, let's just use some cleanliness, some, some, some common sense things, but things must still go on. So it's balancing that. but. With that impact, we must anticipate it, and that may mean we may have to recalibrate a few things um, in, in anticipation for that. And so, uh, Director um, Hallman, please make note of that. Uh, we have an existing SPLOS that needs to be looked at. Our operating budget needs to be looked at. And, and the public would want to know that we are aware, to your point, well, we know it's not going to be a bailout from the feds to sort of supplement this. Well, how will you get this done, right? And it's going to be a shared impact, a shared um, getting through this. So I want the public to know that we're on this. I, I've committed myself, you know, put the most part alongside Madam Chair, to a full-time effort. It, this is different. Uh, it's something that we've got our minds around. I think you guys are doing a great job, but I want to say I, I know you got this. I, I've seen you guys work <laughs> over the past decade. You've got this. Um, but at the same point, we have to, um, Madam Chair, we're showing our commitment to you to make sure that while you're out there doing all those things, the back operations is still flowing, and we keep our minds on that as well. I yield the floor, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good. Commissioner, go ahead. Just one quick question, and this was brought forth by one of my citizens. Will the voting precincts still be open even though the libraries are closed and the senior citizen did, uh, facility did, is did, closed? The voting? Did, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Did I see something where the state suspended the? I yeah, we yeah, could okay, come up and give us. <coughs> if, 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 uh, is it all right for me to leave? If you have any more questions, I'd be glad to stay. But I've got like six meetings back to back. Yes. I need to get. Yes. It, you, so you I, didn't want to leave, I didn't want to be rude and leave without. You may go. All right. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, and I'll thank see you, you soon in our meeting. Okay. okay. Good morning, Good Board morning. of Commissioners, mm -hmm. staff. Uh, I wanted to address your question, Secretary of State. Um, over the weekend, uh, issued a suspension, a delay of the presidential primary uh, in terms of suspending uh, voting at the precincts, delaying the primary to uh, May 19th. I was in touch with uh, Milton Kidd, who called me, informed me of that. We uh, then communicated that uh, to the public, to the citizens of Douglas County making them aware, making internal staff aware as well, posting that information 
on CelebrateDouglasCounty.com with much other information in regards to the impact of the corona, coronavirus situation uh, and also as well as informing the public through social media. So suspension of voting immediately has occurred, yes. Even this morning, staff- Suspension, what, for two weeks or what? Did have delayed until May 19th. <laughs> delayed till May 19th. So those who have not voted yet will be able to vote on May 19th. Okay, that is the general primary date also, mm -hmm. so. Correct, that okay. is correct. So they'll vote for both issues at the same time? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's been, what the Secretary of State said. We've got some sickness in our family yes. uh, due yes. to cancer, so I've been at the hospital at Emory. Oh, hospital. this just happened this weekend, but yes. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. And while you're there, Director Martin, if you could just speak about the PSA and then um, I'll talk about the, the mailers we sent out and then I'll ask Don Evers to come up and share about the purchasing powers and what the county administrator and myself have and then we'll move on with our meeting. Sure. In regards to the PSA, uh, I think it was Friday. Yeah, <laughs> I'm Friday. sorry. Yeah. My, my, my days are running together uh, in terms of uh, communication. But uh, yes, ma'am, uh, on Friday, uh, uh, yourself, Madam Chair, along with uh, uh, Dr. Maymark from uh, Cobb and Douglas Public Health, um, along with others uh, 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 who were present as part of the PSA, others as such as City of Douglasville's Mayor, uh, Rochelle Robinson, and City of uh, Villarica Mayor, uh, uh, Mr. Gil McDougal, uh, were present along with uh, other department heads, uh, Director uh, Milholland as well, uh, to produce a PSA that is currently uh, airing on our website, uh, celebratedouglascounty.com, as well as DCTV23, as well as Comcast, uh, you know, beginning now, uh, to really ef uh, effectively communicate uh, to the public what needs to be done, what measures to take, and where to go for further information. Uh, we, were, we were able to produce that uh, rather quickly and effectively, and proud of my staff uh, who was able to come and shoot that, and that's station manager, TJ Jaglinski, along with our communications and media specialist, Lena Hardy. Um, so, you know, wanted to share that as well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, You're welcome, Director thank Martin. you. Also, Board of Commissioners, just wanted to make you aware that we sent a, uh, on behalf of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners, a mailer was sent out to the public to about 58,000 parcels, uh, uh, first class. Hopefully those will be hitting the doorsteps uh, at least Monday or two, well, Tuesday or Wednesday, because I know it takes time for the mail to uh, move forward. Uh, it has tips on this mailer on the back, and it provides you just the things that I discussed earlier, wash your hands, um, tells you all the, uh, some of the cleaning um, solutions or sanitizers to use, and just, just give you some tips just in case you say, now what did they say? It's already there, so that's coming to your home, so expect that real soon. And then um, we have an update that the, uh, our county administrator is under the weather today, and he followed, uh, certainly adhered to the precautionary measures and just didn't, he, he's not here. But of course, uh, the employee uh, COVID-19 coronavirus information guidance update is being sent to all our governmental employees this morning. I encourage you to read it, it's quite lengthy, but it, it will give you all the details and it will respond to a lot of the questions that you have as an employee. And we, you will hear from me soon so I could address the employees, okay, of this county. Now, uh, Don Everts, if you would come up and just share with us the purchasing power that myself and the county administrator have, and then we're gonna move into our meeting. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Don Everts, purchasing director. Under our code of ordinance, we have an emergency purchasing procedure. It's section 9-26, and it reads, emergency purchases are defined as those purchases irrespective of amount, made necessary by situations which could not be anticipated by the department head, usually involving the threatening circumstances or risk of injury or resulting in work stoppages, undue delay, or occurring during non-business hours when the ordinary purchase procedures cannot be followed. 
If an emergency requiring a purchase occurs during business hours and time permits, the department head shall contact the purchasing agency and obtain an emergency purchase order number. The item sought may then be acquired using that number. If time does not permit or the emergency occurs during non-business hours, the department head shall make the purchase and immediately upon the resolution of the emergency, a requisition shall be prepared stating that nature of the emergency. The requisition shall be forwarded promptly to the purchasing agency together with the purchase receipt and a memorandum from the department head setting forth the details of the emergency shall likewise be submitted. Any department head who is an elected official or who is under the supervision of an elected official, not the board of commissioners, shall submit to the purchasing agent the written certification of the elected official as to the emergency nature of the purchase along with the requisition. All emergency purchases shall be approved by the county administrator. The purchasing agent shall, be revu shall review emergency purchases which exceed $50,000 at the first meeting of the Board of Commissioners following such emergency purchases. As it relates to the county administrator and the commission chair, purchasing approval, requisitions over $10,000 and one cents and up to $25,000 shall be approved or denied by the county administrator except that otherwise required for road construction, but that's not an, in emergency situations. Requisitions over the $25,000 and one cents up to $50,000 shall be approved or denied by the county administrator and commission chair or vice chair in the absence of the commission chair. Okay. Any questions from the board or comments? All right, thank you. It's pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Carthen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in wake of what's going on, we do know that our citizens out there may be struggling, those who, even before the COVID-19. So are we working with our public and private uh, entities such as WSA, Georgia Power, Greystone, in order to ensure that those citizens who may be uh, really close to getting things cut off, perhaps, um, have we been in contact with them? Because we know that washing of hands and being able to get information is, is really critical during this time. Thank you, Commissioner Carthen. That's a very good question. Certainly have been in contact with uh, our WSA service, one of the board of directors there. And um, we are making exceptions at this time to make sure that we don't shut anyone off. Uh, board of Commissioners, you should be receiving some information today from our director, Executive Director Gil Shur Shurhaus. Had a meeting with him Saturday morning, uh, myself, uh, the mayor, and the chairman of the WSA board. So we, we are, again, you know, we want to make sure that we tread lightly, but the goal and the, the objective is not to shut anyone off. Gary Miller, who is the uh, CEO of the Greystone Power, sent out a uh, uh, bulletin last night. I did make sure that Board of Commissioners, you all received it. I sent it to you via my personal email because it came through my personal email. And Greystone Power is doing the same as well. And I, they're planning on not to shut off uh, your power, the powers of our citizens in this um, extenuating circumstance. I also met with the um, mayor of Villarica yesterday, had a phone conference with him. Uh, he is, of course, a lot of his citizens are, they utilize Greystone Power and also WSA, but also they have, we, uh, there's a component where some of the citizens utilize Villarica water. And so he has a meeting this morning, so I believe they will be in, uh, implementing the same standard of not shutting off water and power. So I will keep you all posted. I have not spoken with Georgia Power yet, and I will keep you posted. I need to follow up with them today. Board of Commissioners, if there is nothing else, we'll start our meeting. Um, and I will encourage our uh, directors going forward, if you could, uh, just uh, make sure when you present items for the next couple of weeks or months, if we just make sure that there's something that it has to be urgent and something that you really, really need and just can't wait because we want to try to uh, minimize our agendas as much as possible to keep down the social distancing. Okay, I'm going to start with Board of Commissioners be prepared to approve the minutes accordingly tomorrow and then uh, also please be prepared to approve our expenses accordingly. Also, we may, uh, I just want to let the citizens know it depends on 
which way the tide turns, we may uh, even uh, look at uh, this Board of Commissioners, uh, we may look into teleconferencing, but however, we will have an, uh, a venue or, or a conduit where our citizens can view us live uh, from your homes. We just, uh, because we know all our meetings are open to the public. So we are working on that now with our uh, Director of Information Technology, but right now I don't foresee it, but things are changing by the minute, so we will keep you posted. Okay, Board of Commissioners, we're going to move into tab number four, authorization to apply FY21 CJC, JC, I mean CJCC reimbursement grant for the state court DUI drug court program and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Anita Granger. Ms. Good morning, Granger. Madam Chair. Good morning. Commissioners. Good morning. Um, just, this is just for permission to apply for the grant. Um, as you know, the county policy says we have to come before you to apply, especially when there's a match. Um, this year I'm applying and asking for $130,823. The match for that will be $14,535 if the whole amount is awarded. Generally, they don't give me the whole amount. Last year I got $98,000. So um, that match always comes from my salary. So um, it's already built into um, the budget. Okay. All right. That's pretty self-explanatory okay. Board of Commissioners. Right. If there are no issues, we're going to move on to the next one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Tab number five, authorization for the chairman to execute amended uh, employee, employee contract of Don Paul from Family Treatment Court Ch Child Services Case Manager to Family Treatment Court Case Manager. Jennifer King. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is through our federal grant for our drug court program. The client case manager we had in position has resigned, so I'm asking to revise Don Paul's contract to go from our child case manager to a, a client case manager. Okay. Primarily budget neutral, just it's a all shift. grant okay. and everything's been approved through the grant source. Okay. Board of Commissioners, if you don't have any questions, I believe if there are no issues, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Thank you. You have one more. I have two more. You have two more. <laughs> I'm okay. so sorry. Tab number, no, that's okay. Tab number six, authorization to create a new grant funded position of family treatment court clinician. This is also Jennifer, our, could you pull your... I'm sorry. Okay. Thank Try you. not to get too close to it. Um, <laughs> This is also through the federal grant, and in moving Don Paul from one position to another, it opens up the funding to change that position to an on-site clinician who will complete all of our assessments and provide some services for our drug court clients. Okay. Again, budget neutral? Yes. Okay. If there are no issues from the Board of Commissioners or questions, we'll move on to the next one. Tab number seven, authorization to add two grant-funded part-time van driver positions for transporting minors to programming? Um, this is to create uh, drivers. Jill Hopson, I know y'all are familiar with Jill in my office, runs some of our at-risk youth programs. The state had been providing transportation for those youth from school to the groups, um, and they're not doing that any longer. So they were, they're assisting us. The, the state grant funding that she receives is assisting us to be able to provide this service um, through the county. Okay. So it's grant is it is funded okay. again. Okay, Board of Commissioners, don't seem like we have any issues, but that being said, we're gonna move on. Thank you Thank so you. much, Ms. King. We're gonna move on to tab number eight, authorization for the chairman to execute employment uh, contracts with Jarvis Williams and Robin Wild Wilder as assistant public defendants in our state court. Uh, Attorney Miles. Good morning. Good morning. This uh, request is budget neutral as well. These are the vacancies that we've had and we've hired attorneys, so these are the two contracts to uh, fill those vacant positions. Again, there's no impact on the budget. And I had the next tab as well, which okay. was a follow-up to the meeting that we had two weeks ago mm -hmm. with the restructuring of the um, three of the positions in our office to do contracts on those, which again is budget neutral. Okay, and there was the authorization for the chairman to execute amended employment contracts with assistant public defenders Ceylon Copes and Bethany uh, Casa and Chris Sunbach for work in the Superior Court. Yeah, we did have conversations, but everything is neutral. Board of Commissioners, any issues at this time? No, All right, we're going to move forward. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming in today. Authorization, tab number 10, authorization for Douglas County Sheriff's Office to accept the Governor's Office Highway Safety Heat grant in the amount of $346,912.52 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. 
Major Holmes. Good morning. This is a grant that we've had for numerous years. Uh, this past year, we chose not to uh, renew it, and we went this year and we applied for the full grant. So um, that's that's going to wind up replacing three vehicles and supplying three of the deputies. So uh, it's just something that for a number of years now, we've been getting a partial part of the grant, and we held out for a year, and we were able to re reapply, and we've got it. The full grant? Mm -hmm. Yes. Madam Chair, while you got Bobby there, if there's no questions on this one, can we skip down to 19 because that involves Bobby so he can leave oh, and absolutely. get yes. into his social distancing? Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, question any, any questions? Okay, um, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah good, good morning. Good morning. Real quick question, um, again, um, this is a nice healthy grant um, and, and it's appreciated. Um, you said cars. What else? S say that again. I just couldn't hear it. It'll pay for three positions. Three positions. We have, it's a four-man unit that we've had for years. Yep. It'll pay for three positions and replace three cars. So it actually can pay for uh, personnel? Yes. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. And right, we're going to move on to tab number 19. <laughs> Do you have one, Commissioner? Okay. Tab number 19, authorization to approve the in building radio distri distribution agreement easement agreement and the right of entry agreement between the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, the Douglas County Board of Commissioners, and the Selco uh, Partnership and rescind the previous approval given on July 23rd, 2019 on the same documents uh, with Verizon Wireless LLC and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. And I can help Bobby start this and Bobby okay. may need to chime in, Madam Chair. So uh, this has been a long drawn out negotiation over the language and part of it was due to this portion of Verizon Wireless being acquired by Chelco or Selco, excuse me, partnership. The sheriff's office approves of the transaction. We finally have gotten the words correct, but we felt like the board's records need to reflect the agreement is not with Verizon, it's actually with Chelco partnership who acquired that asset from Verizon. So same service, same stuff, the technical terms we negotiated, at, well, it's been more than six months, as you know, but part of it was dragged out because of the acquisition by Trailco. And Bobby, I think you can speak for the sheriff. He wants this deal done, correct? Yes, he does. Okay, do you have anything to add? This, uh, just to refresh y'all, this was to upgrade equipment inside the jail, Verizon equipment, and also to uh, provide for an easement access to get to their equipment. That's what, basically in a nutshell, what this agreement is. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners on this one? Okay. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Roger, you too. Thank you. We're going to move on to tab number 11, authorization to adopt, to adopt the resolution and award the bid for a TAN anticipation note to PNC Bank in the amount of $25 million for an annual rate of 0.62% and $5,000 bank legal fees and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Don Evers, but we had yes, we spoke and <laughs> our finance, Jennifer Holman. Our, our minds were thinking alike. I told her if she wanted me to, I'd come up here and just talk about the tax anticipation note because I know it's going to uh, have questions or comments around our cash flow. Um, but we are um, very happy to report. Um, as you know, we brought before y'all uh, about a month ago to go out to bid for tax anticipation notes um, for $25 million. Um, and we had the bid opening last Thursday. Uh, we had five banks uh, pr uh, present a bid, a sealed bid, to purchasing department. Uh, the winning bid is PNC, PNC Bank at 0.62%, which is awesome. Uh, nice. The other banks uh, also, you know, were very competitive. Um, we had Truist Bank with 0.67, JP Morgan at 0.79, Regions at 0.99, and First Citizens Bank and Trust at 1.44. Uh, so, of course, uh, just based on the rates, um, PNC won the bid at 0.62%. And uh, barring $25 million, we'll be closing, if y'all authorize and approve this tomorrow, we'll be closing on the 27th of this month. Um, and those funds will, at the 0.62%, have an interest expense of $117,111. Um, in speaking with our municipal advisor as well, um, 
the timing was of the essence with these tax anticipation notes. Um, because now that the market is in panic mode, um, there are some banks that are pulling away from these types of loans. Uh, so not only did we get a good rate and a competitive rate, um, but if we would have waited any longer, then it could have been that we wouldn't have had as much competition and we definitely wouldn't have had the 0.62%. So, um, and again, to remind you, uh, we did borrow for, borrow for a cushion, a working capital. And at the time, of course, we did not know this was going on, but we said we wanted to have a cushion just in case things beyond our control happen. And here we are today. So we're gonna have $25 million put in the bank um, on the 27th, March 27th. And um, I believe that is all for the tax participation date, unless you have any questions. Okay, any questions from the board? Uh, comments, uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, Finance to, um, Chairman as well. No, th thank you, Madam Chair. And, and again, I want to commend the finance um, department and, and, and our municipal advisors for helping facilitate this process. Um, I know we went back and forth um, to get to a certain um, consensus on this, uh, but we made the right choice. And um, to that point, um, sometimes it takes seasoning to understand what we're looking at. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here pleased to know that we have room to work with, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's very material now. Uh, you have relief on your operating expenses to make your cash flows, but at the same point, we have something to work with on the backside, especially with Jason Milholland's commentary that says, okay, all federal do dollars are not gonna be reimbursable per se. There may be some hits. So I'm, I'm glad that we can continue to meet our operating expenses as we plan according to the budget, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, uh, good process. Uh, thank you, Director Hallman, for keep pushing uh, to, to accelerate um, going to the marketplace. And again, we wouldn't have anticipated this, but we did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Get ahead of it. And sometimes it's about getting ahead of things. And um, job well done. Great rate. What was the last year's rate again? Yes, I'm glad you said that. Last year's rate was 2.25%. Right. So last year we borrowed $18 million mm -hmm. for and a 2.25 rate. Cost us about $271,000. And this year we borrowed $25 million. And a month earlier. And a month earlier. 0.62%, and it's costing us only $117,000. Excellent. It speaks for <laughs> itself. Madam Chair, I yield. Okay. Thank you so much, Director. Do you, um, do you mind I have the other agenda item uh, while I'm up here, or do you want me to wait? <laughs> I'll, I'll just, yeah, let's, let's go with you. And okay. that's tab number 15, resolution mm -hmm. to amend the 2020 budget for the 2019 rollover in Cumberson's grants and projects. Yes, this is what I uh, call just a typical housekeeping adjustment that comes before the board this time every single year when we're winding down mm -hmm. and closing the year. Uh, what this is are any open purchase orders that were open at the end of 2019 that for whatever reason, either the service hasn't been performed yet, the item hasn't been received yet, they are rolled over to the new year, 2020. Um, and so when they are rolled over, the budget goes along with it because it makes it budget neutral. So it doesn't impact the department's budget. We give them the money to cover that purchase order or project. So at the end of the year, we had um, open purchase orders that were rolled over. And since that time, from January and February, some of those purchase orders have been liquidated because we've made payments. But we wait until we close the year to bring it before you to make it a formal action of amending the budget. As well as there are uh, projects that may not have had a purchase order yet, um, but we know that are going to occur and were budgeted and money was set in the budget in 2020. Um, that we didn't re-budget for, I mean, I'm sorry, set aside in the 2019 budget that we did not set aside in 2020 because we knew we were gonna roll those over. Um, as well as some grants, um, a good example is Gary Watson with Connect Douglas Grants. There were some grants that were approved late last year for the construction of the expansion of the grant. So we're actually, um, you know, that's part of this number as well, is to move and roll that money over the 2020 um, budget for the revenue that we would get as well as the expenditure that will occur. Okay. So all just housekeeping. And this is already recognized when we close 2019. Uh, we are required to what they call a signed fund balance. That means we have to pull it out of unassigned and we, we do that every year. So it's already taken in, cons in consideration when we close the books. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? 
So I take it this is pretty self-explanatory. Yes. Thank you. It's not You're pretty quick. routine. Okay. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, Hold just on. real quick. Don't. So um, normal house clean, clean, cleaning, et cetera, I understand. We're closed to books. Has the auditors kicked in yet? Would no, they are scheduled to start their audit, uh, some of their field work, um, next Monday, depending on what goes on around here. Um, but they're on, uh, they're on our calendar. They put us on their calendar for the 23rd. Uh, they usually start with the elected officials, constitutional officers first, uh, and do all of their you know, audit procedures with them. But they uh, work in our conference room. That's kind of their main hub. Um, and then we gather information uh, within the finance department to give them as well. Okay. okay. All right. That, that was it. And just pre pre previous question regarding the TAN. To clarify just for the record, we borrowed $25 million. What was the operating that we needed and what's the spread that we have extra? It was uh, an ex uh, estimated $22 million that we needed. So we have a $3 million working capital. Right. All right. $3 million working capital. Mm -hmm. The point is when you go to the bank, um, get what you need. Um, don't Correct. nickel and dime. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's always better to be overcapitalized than be undercapitalized. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Gardner. Uh, and it's great that we got such a great um, interest rate, but uh, the $25 million does have to be paid back by the end of the year. So we, if we have unexpected um, expenditures as a result of all of this uh, uh, mm -hmm. coronavirus thing that we're going to have to make sure that we may have to cut in other areas of unnecessary spending in order to uh, meet this big payment that's going to come at the end of the year when taxes start coming in. So, Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, as mentioned, you know, we're probably going to discuss it further in the Finance Committee meeting that we have scheduled today, but, you know, we're, we're always keeping track of the cash, revenues, and expenditures. Uh, Y'all may see it on a monthly report, but I promise you in my office uh, it's a weekly thing, if not a daily thing, on certain things that we look at. Um, so, yeah, we will definitely be tracking it and making sure that nothing looks out of whack and that if something does, just because it's, again, something beyond our control, that we have the efficient, you know, sufficient resources uh, cash. I'm going to be meeting with my staff um, after this work session to go over, you know, uh, just to let y'all know, as well as the employees that are watching, you know, what are, what are we going to do with payroll? How are we going to get that uh, done? Uh, you know, accounts payable to our vendors, you know, mm -hmm. so we're going to be kind of coming up with what I call an operational game plan uh, for uh, and just with my primary folks. And then once we kind of come with an agreement or a discussion and a, a plan, we'll share that with staff and definitely keep y'all apprised of what, what we're going to do. Okay. You okay. okay. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Geiger. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Jim. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to tab number 12, authorization to award a contract to Jericho Design Group for Engineering Architectural Grant Services for FY2020 Community Development Block Grant. CDBG for senior services in the amount of $3,800 for the preliminary engineering report to be paid out of the, the contingency funds uh, and 8.75% of all construction costs to be paid with grant funding once Douglas County receives the grant and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents, documents subject to final legal review. Uh, thank you, Director Gilchrist, Dr. Gilchrist. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we <clears throat> did receive three bids um, for the architect engineering services, and Jericho was the one that um, was selected after evaluation by all committee members. Okay. Any questions from the board or comments? Sounds like you're headed down the path uh, in the right direction to obtain this grant for the senior services. We uh, last, I think, two weeks ago, we approved. Um, a for portion the, for the grant writer. For the grant writer. And now yes. this this portion is to move on, so would someone can look at the design. So. A absolutely, and we've been working um, closely with the grant writer, MPS Grants, and um, on Friday we did contact ARC just to see if the deadline was still April first. And as of Friday, the deadline is April first. Okay. So we're moving forward with that and. Um, after once this is approved, we'll have the architect engineer to come to the site and work with them. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, 
We appreciate all, all right. the work you're doing for our seniors. We're going to move on to tab number 13, authorization to issue. A, a, Dr. Gilchrist, if you could come back up. I'm sorry. Vice Chairman, I didn't see your hand. Give a chance to answer yeah, a question. My, oh, I did. I asked. And you know what? Yeah. My, no, no. My, peripher my uh, peripheral vision didn't catch your hand. So no, no, um, no. Vice Chairman Rob. No, I'll, I'll be quick. So again, um, this is just for the design work. This is only for the design work. Absolutely. Okay, so, and maybe this is to a broader question. I know our, our county administrator is not here, but uh, to the public, we're, we're still moving forward, uh, recognizing we're in a, a public um, health crisis moment. Uh, there are things that still must go on. So that means that contracts are being awarded. Um, and so um, somewhat related to this, since this is a work session, your, your senior services, does that mean also that the senior center is still moving forward. Madam Chair, maybe you can speak to that. Does it, we, we continue on, are we having our groundbreaking, I know it's wet, that, that, that's to the side, but um, moving forward, can you talk to us? Yes, I, I do believe that um, the new senior center in Lithia Springs, that work is still moving forward. We have, we do not have a new date for the groundbreaking as of yet. Okay, mm -hmm. I just want, I'm good Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, yeah, we don't have a new date right now it, with all, Things consider at this point. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Commissioner Guider. Yes. Um, uh, Mrs. Gilchrist, this is for the uh, Senior Center on Fairburn Road. Is yes. that right? Yes, okay. ma'am. That's correct. Just wanted to let the public know what we were talking about because when we say sen senior services, they may not understand what exactly we're talking about, but it's for the probably the oldest facility that we have in the county. Uh, for the seniors. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and what this process is, um, the, the Georgia Department of Community Affairs, they have an opportunity for a community development block grant in the amount of $750,000. And so we have been moving forward with applying for that grant, and we are very optimistic that we will receive the $750,000 from DCA to help um, remodel, rehab the center that's located at 6287 Fairburn Road. And out of that center, we do congregate meals on a daily basis and activities for older adults in Douglas County. This facility was the hospital for Douglas Old County. Old hospital. Way back when. <laughs> so uh, yes. it's uh, much those needed. that have been around as long as I have, <laughs> they know this, but some of the newcomers would not. So I just wanted them to understand what building we're talking about. Yes, All right. that's With that, building. I yield back. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Commissioner Guider. Commissioner Carthen. Yes. Dr. Gil Gilchrist, since you are there, do you have any um, information that you would like to share with the citizens in regards to looking after the senior citizens who won't be congregating at the senior um, center since we've forego the, the congregating with the meals. Meals on wheels will still go forward, but can you mm -hmm. speak to you know, the Yes, rest of at this time, um, our home delivered meals, which is Meals on me Wheels, we will continue that service. Um, we're also doing the homemaker service, that's still going forward. We also will um, continue our medical transport, non-emergency medical transport. We have about 100 citizens who receive non-emergency medical transport on a monthly basis, so that will continue. Also, with those who come to the center at 6287 Fairburn Road for congregate meals and congregate programs, we've ordered, we're in the process of ordering shelf-stable meals, um, and we have funding from the Atlanta Regional Commission to help cover that. That's at a cost of about $9,200 um, for shelf-stable meals, which is a 10-day supply of meals for those um, citizens. Also, another thing that we're looking into is maybe doing a drive-up service because we do prepare hot meals out of the center. We're looking at for those who drive into the center on a regular basis, it's doing a drive-up where they'll be able to come and pick up a hot meal if they choose to. 
Thank you, Dr. Gilchrist, okay. for thinking of all of that. I just was wondering myself, and I know others had asked me on Friday when I delivered their meal, would their meals still be coming with, with shutting down things? So Absolutely. thank you for getting that yeah. out. We know that a lot of our senior citizens are isolated, and for those who come to the Centers for Activity, sometimes that's the only socialization they receive, the only human contact that a lot of them receive on mm -hmm. a daily basis. So we are certain to make sure that they continue to receive that contact um, through the home delivered meals and also those who are able to come into the program. Another thing that we're doing, we're making phone calls mm -hmm. to check on them on a daily basis just to make sure that they're okay and to see if they have any needs that we can help meet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair, just one question. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Carthen from Commissioner Guida. Yes, uh, will you be needing uh, additional volunteers? We're always in need of volunteers. Uh, <laughs> we're always in need of volunteers. However, with volunteers, there's a process that all volunteers must go through because we definitely want to protect our senior citizens. And so anyone who wishes to volunteer, they must be fingerprinted. They have to go through the fingerprinting process and a, um, a background check. And so we can't just have people to show up and say, I want to help deliver meals today. There is an application and a process. And is that application online that they could submit the application and then go have their fingerprints made? No, ma'am. They must come to um, 6287 Fairburn Row and okay. meet with our volunteer coordinator, and then the volunteer coordinator will give them instructions from that point. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But thanks, for, thanks for asking that question, though, because we are um, in need of volunteers. Due to the coronavirus outbreak, we've had two groups that normally help us deliver the meals they've canceled because they are a vulnerable population themselves. And so they've canceled. And, and at this point, we have staff that's working hard to help deliver the meals, including myself. Okay. Yes, ma'am. OK, OK. OK. Well, thank you. Thank Great you. Great information you provide mm -hmm. us a wealth of knowledge here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, we're going to move on to tab 13. <coughs> Number 13, I'm sorry. Authorization to issue invitation for bids for a new roof for the Deer Lick Park Activity Center to be funded through SPLOSH funds as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee. Director Dukes. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, ma'am. Just as you said, we're asking permission to uh, go out for bid for a new roof for the Deer Lick Activity Center and to fund that through our SPLOSH program. Okay. Any questions from the board or the, at this time? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, please chime in. Yes, Deer Lake, um, one of our only, what, indoor uh, facilities that we have here in the county. Um, you know, um, it, and so talk to me about the need to repair this roof. I mean, it, it's been, what, a long time coming. Give, give the background why we need to do this and why we're doing it now. I get it, the SPLOS is funding it, but give the background for the public, Gary, please. Yes, it's been an ongoing problem for several years. Mm -hmm. um, we have actually asked for the roof to be replaced in the last two budget cycles. And uh, it was actually recommended as a priority, but uh, for whatever reason, it didn't get funded. So uh, it started with leaks in the office, office areas, and then it's expanded to the gymnasium. Mm -hmm. So we've got leaks in various uh, portions uh, we've uh, had people out, roofers out, to have it uh, patched on several different occasions, but uh, the leaks continue and new leaks continue to pop up. So that's why we're here. Okay. And, and, and to that point, I've, I've had a town hall there too. And as you know, I'm in the offices and I'm kicking over the bucket of water. And it's like, <laughs> wait a minute, hold on now. And, and, but, but, but to that point, um, at, at some point, um, you, you have to, you can repair or you replace. And I think what I'm hearing you saying that we, we've repaired and patched as long as we can. Um, uh, Deer Lake is still an important asset on, on a county our size to only have one indoor facility. Um, and I know that um, the Parks and Rec study that was done when you first came on board, uh, what, we were about four behind. Uh, we're now adding one obviously out at Boundary Waters to sort of, sort of get rid of that, that deficit on the need for that. But, but, but Deer Lake is still a gym. It's an important asset for the county. Uh, and obviously, we've got a very nice 
um, tennis court coming online. We got a nice animal shelter out there, but the actual gym of it, it has a roof that's falling down and it's tearing up our floor. So I, I just think that, and I know there was some consideration to actually knock down Deer Lake to build um, the new community center that's at Bounty Waters. And I, I did, as you know, I disagree with that, that choice uh, because it was too important. And I appreciate you may, you know, keep pushing that. Yes, sometimes things don't make it through the BIR process. I get it. That's to all directors. You guys know you got to keep advocating. <laughs> you got to keep advocating. Um, but I'm glad to hear, Madam Chair, that there was a decision made by the Parks and Rec mm -hmm. Committee to, to really d to deal with this. Um, it didn't need to be torn down. Uh, it still has some usefulness, some utility in it. And I'm glad that um, replacing the roof is, is, is the course of action. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. And then we'll move on to tab number 14, authorization to purchase a composting double vault restroom building for Billard Park at a cost of $46,523.11 to be funded through the SPLOST funds as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Dukes again. Yes, ma'am. As, uh, as you are aware, we're building a new a uh, concession stand restroom and press box at the park. But due to the elevation uh, at the park, some of the fields are on a lower elevation. And the, uh, anyone handicapped using those lower fields will not be able to access the new concession stand at the higher elevation. So we are requesting to put one of the vaulted restroom facilities on the lower uh, fields so the handicapped uh, attendees will be able to uh, access the restroom. Yeah. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, board commissioners, anyone have a comment on that one? Uh, Commissioner Geider. Yes, I noticed that neither one of these have prices on them. Uh, so uh, our estimated prices, is this going to affect any plant? These were not on the Splash, no. yes, to begin with, either one no. of them. The, uh, the vault price, the restroom vault is 46000 It's on there. Okay. Yes, yeah, on there. But as long as I can remember, that's been a problem at Bell Arp. I don't understand why this was not addressed years ago uh, because uh, I've been, a, Bell Arp used to be in my district, so I met with them. When I first came on board, you were out there and Eric Linton and everybody, and we talked about the uh, a ramp or something for the handicap on the two lower fields. I understand where they are, and uh, but and this was really against uh, the American Disabilities Act that Correct. we did not have that, and I'm just wondering why has this not been addressed? Good grief, that was almost nine years ago. Cost. Uh, we had a ramp. Uh, but it, why was it it on the splash list? Well, I I can't answer that question. I was not on the committee, so uh, for the recommendation, so I don't know. Well, it, what is this going to do to the projects that were on the list? Well, according to Terry, uh, the county administrator asked Terry Gable if the flow of the funds would accommodate these and he said they would and that's the only information i have so it's not going to push the the items that was on the list that was uh, voted on by the citizens committee and everything it's not going to push those off is there uh like the concession stands at uh, fair play no it's not going to affect that mm -hmm. okay and um well, I guess, uh, and the concession stand at Bell Arc, that those were the two that was yeah, being listed. But it will affect some of the fencing, I'm sure. I, I, he just told me the, the flow would accommodate the roof. The flow of? The funds. The funds. Would accommodate the roof, yes. Okay, and how much is the roof going to cost? Well, we won't know until we get the bids. We submitted two years ago and last year a cost of ninety thousand yeah. dollars to replace the roof. I remember so, going until out until there we and get looking new. at that facility also, even though it was not in my. We I went up out there with a contractor, and uh, uh, there was a lot of leakage and everything back right. then. But uh, I don't understand why priority things like this were not on the splash list to begin with. 
are was not uh, budgeted in our budget because they, if they're emergency now, it's just like the lights down at Fair Play. It was $400,000. It was way down the list, but it was emergency three or four years ago and that we, they were dangerous. And those were in the budget, asked in the budget. They were asked in the budget and they were cut. Uh, right. Some things, you know, if they're emergency, you need to stress to this board and the, the uh, financial department that these are emergencies. These aren't something we can kick the can down they the They were put, the lights were put in the budget as an emergency. But it was cut. Yes. Yes. So um, I don't understand why things like this are happening. When we have had the splash, we had the splash committee, and I know you talked to the splash committee uh, on priorities, and they, to me, these should have been priorities. So with that, um, Jennifer, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, Mark just, uh, county administrator just gave me a few notes through the text um, that the Deer Lick roof was a county administrator recommendation when we went to the budget retreat. Okay. Um, and then two, that these two items that's on the agenda uh, would need to come from your equipment line item in your splossed, uh, splossed well, budget. So they're going to be offset by uh, some money the, that's already in the splash yeah, for well, equipment. The, the first, the roof, would not be able to, but uh, it's recommended as a splash flow, the money flowing in. Any money, uh, the restroom, 46000 if the flow of the, as we discussed in the Recreation Oversight Committee, if the flow would not accommodate the restroom, we would take that from our uh, equipment money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and, I, and I just urge this board, when, when he comes before us and he says this is an emergency, those are things that should not be cut out of a budget. Maybe some of the other things, it's not an emergency, could be cut instead of things like this. But this has been going on for several years, especially with the lights <laughs> down at Fair Play, because you, you put it in uh, BRR for two years, but then you didn't put it in there thinking it was going to go in the um, splash, on the splash, which it did, but it was way down on the totem pole and somebody should have said hey this has got to be way up here and we eventually had to move it up there so when the where there's danger to kids or or destruction to uh, facilities that we already have and we want to maintain them we have to maintain them Absolutely. on a timely basis we cannot just kick the can down the road and wait till they get worse and then it costs a lot more money and then you don't have may not have the funds so uh, with that, I yield back. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Guider. Oh, okay, uh, Commissioner Robinson. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I thank you, you both, and I, I appreciate Madam Guider's point. Um, you know, to all credit to the county administrator, he's not here, but you know, we, we were blessed that um, the public voted for a spot even to begin with. Right, um, and I, I have to acknowledge that, right, um, some of this stuff has been, these are old parks. So if you go back to 09, the prior splost, and going into recession, we had nothing to work with. I have to give some credit and some room to the administration to not paint a picture that, no, you had nothing to work with. Our priority was to build a half million square foot jail. We were in the middle of the Great Recession. Property taxes were down 40 percent. You had nothing to maintain, nothing. Now we moved through this process and now we're at this place. And I appreciate the sentiments of, yes, it was so much need, the county administrator did the best he could almost, what, four years ago? What, that would have been 17, three years ago when we went to, to Wall Street. We had a day, doc, um, Director Hallman, a day or two to come up with a list according to the categories, right? I mean, so there was a, there was a, a base list from the time that, from that November of 16 to uh, 
April of, what, 17, when we went to market, or when we actually went before then, it was really been about March. And so I, I want to give context to say to, to the administration, you did the best you could with what you had. And, and I, I think it, uh, without it being so sharp that, no, I get it. It was so much need. Nothing had been maintained. These things have been built way back, what, 20, 2002 SPLOS? We're talking about 20 years of, of very minimum maintenance and, and, and several thousands of people moving in. Right? So I, I, I get it. Um, you couldn't get to it all. Um, you did the best you can. The county administrator did the best he can, bring a new administrator to come up with a list to, 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 to get up to speed. So you guys, we're going to get, I will give you a little room to say you did the best you could. Uh, I think going forward, uh, we'll have a more formal maintenance program, Madam Chair. I think you guys understand that. I think the citizens will support a, a more committed um, a, approach to parks and rec if that's a priority. Again, I still acknowledge um, Commissioner Mitchell, who, who advocated um, you know, from 11 to the 17 percent. To think about it, this would have been 11 percent splossed for parks and rec, right? That was an important decision to when he said, this is not enough. And like the day he wasn't here, uh, but yet I had to carry his, 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 his input. And so again, one more time, you, we, it, 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 and I agree with the sentiment that it has to be balanced, it has to be, it has to be equitable. It doesn't have to be equal, but there needs to be an equitable distribution, and it, you're trying to find the right balance. But I don't want the, the, the public to think that there was not a concern. It was so pent up and backed up that all we could do is the best we could. But Madam Chair, I want to give credit to the administration for at least acknowledging it. And sometimes it's just a plan. A plan is made of a, a different set of plays. So yes, we had, uh, I'm glad that the Parks and Rec Committee elevated something. You made a decision on Audible. It's not rigid. You guys made a choice to say, hey, we need to move this around. How do we get this in here? Because it is a priority. We didn't get to it last time. That, that's life, some things you can't get to. But I appreciate the fact that you did um, have the foresight and the strength to bring it forward to make this happen. And, and congratulations to the committee. And I yield back. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Madam Chair, uh, you've taken the tour. And you're aware of yeah, the I'm very need. Aware. And uh, I appreciate you moving these projects forward so we can get the restrooms and the concession stands and the press box at Fair Play mm -hmm. and at Bill Arp uh, on the list and, and started. Mm -hmm. Started. Ground breakings are coming real soon. Yes. And well again, yeah, that, that the, the roof is, we need the roof repair at Deer Lake. Uh, it's, it's, it's in bad condition. It's been a while. Bad shape. It's been a while. So, Thank you so, uh, for bringing this forward. And, and prior to 2017, we didn't even have a Parks and Rec uh, Recreation Committee. So this committee has been uh, so important and so vital to the, just moving Parks and Recreation Absolutely. forward here in Douglas County. Got a lot so, accomplished through the committee. Through this committee. So thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to tab number 16. We've already covered 15, authorization to advertise for a public hearing for the purposes of street name and address changes in the area of relocated Post Road and Veterans Memorial Highway. Director Valentin. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and mm -hmm. Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. I'm going to try to pull up a graphic see how well this works <coughs> to illustrate uh, well it's not working very well but uh, essentially what uh, what this item is with uh, the realignment of uh, the intersection of veterans memorial man road post road thank you um, there, w there is some confusion as to um, which street is which and where people live, what end of Connors Road. There's uh, several uh, roads involved, Connors uh, Drive, uh, Post Road, uh, a section of Post Road, and a section of Mason Creek Road. And what we're trying to do is uh, rename those roads with names that are uh, more conducive to the flow of uh, the alignment of the road the way it is now. Previously, uh, Mason Creek Road and Post Road crossed just below that slide. And so uh, 
as you look at the slide on the right hand side, that road that is at a diagonal, that used to be the alignment of Post Road. Well, now uh, Post Road flows directly into Veterans Memorial through a section of what used to be Mason, or what is Mason Creek Road. And that is very confusing. So what we're looking to do is um, get authorization uh, from the board to pursue uh, renaming some of the road segments and um, uh, re, uh, reassigning street uh, addresses so as to avoid uh, the confusion that, that uh, is happening now and to facilitate um, public uh, emergency response uh, when, when needed. Uh, because of the uh, circumstances uh, with the uh, um, COVID-19 um, that we're experiencing, uh, we will coordinate uh, when this public hearing is, is uh, eventually held. Uh, at this point, we're asking for the authorization so that we could advertise it to the public uh, at the appropriate time, but also to be able to reach out to the property owners and make them aware of what we're proposing to do and have some discussion with them so that when the time comes to make the actual change, uh, everybody would be on the same page. Okay. Any questions? Pretty self-explanatory. Okay. We're going to yeah. okay. okay. move on to the next one. Thank you okay. for bringing that to our attention today. Tab number 17, authorization to enter into a utility reimbursement agreement with Plantation Pipeline Company in connection with the Lee Road widening project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin again. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, this uh, agreement uh, was actually started back in 2015, 2016, uh, discussions with Georgia Power. Uh, as you know, we are getting uh, closer to actually being in position to advertise the Lee Road widening project for construction, it is estimated at the end of May would be able to be in position to do that. Uh, prior to that, there are certain elements that have to be, cer certain milestones that have to be achieved, certain things have to be accomplished, and one of them is having all of the utility agreements in place whenever there's the potential for uh, their work to be reimbursable. Now, work by utilities may be reimbursable when they are actually operating outside of the existing right-of-way or when the county, as is the case uh, with Lee Road, buys additional land alongside the existing right-of-way where their facilities are located. So that requires that they relocate their facilities and that incurs an expenditure uh, by the county to reimburse them. Uh, this particular uh, uh, agreement is structured in a way that uh, once the construction project gets underway, they, uh, the Georgia Power uh, will be relocating their facilities. They will be then submitting to the county uh, claims for reimbursement. We will review them at that time and if they are found to be legitimate, uh, subject to reimbursement, then that is an expenditure that would be incurred uh, by the county. The, the anticipated um, level of expenditure maximum is a, a, about 150,000, a little less than $150,000 on this one, but uh, there is a possibility that it will actually turn out to be less than that. Uh, the, the expectation is that this could be uh, covered by the 2016 SPLOS allocation for the project that has already been authorized by the board. Any questions from the board or comment? Comment? Sure. So if, if there are no issues, no. we'll move on. Move on. Okay. Last but not least, we have tab number 18, authorization to enter into a utility reimbursement agreement with Georgia Power in connection with the Lee Road widening project and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a similar agreement. Uh, it would be the last one required in order for us to be able to get the project certified for utilities. The project has already been certified for right-of-way. And uh, uh, with this, it will put us in position for the project to move forward to construction. Okay. Any 
any questions from the board? Or yes. Comments? Okay, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I, I have been asked, and obviously the citizens are very thankful for um, the work that was done to resurface Lee Road, and now we're going into the next phase of this, which is to actually widen it all the way down from the highway to, um, from the bridge to Highway 92. Um, so we anticipate, you know my words, we anticipate um, letting it, uh, what, May? June, yes, May, right? May of this year. Current um, project schedule in May. Uh, we go through the normal procurement process, et cetera, and so we're thinking um, sending it out, getting it back, all the evaluations is necessary, uh, working with um, Director Ever Evers. Uh, we're looking at probably, what, September awarding the contract and then notice to proceed. I just trying to set the public's expectations. Yes, it would be, that's a good time frame. September, October would be the time frame that I would anticipate uh, the actual contract to, to be before the board for, um, a, now, there is, there is a, procedurally, there's another, uh, there's a step that precedes that, and that is we will receive the bids, analyze the bids, and then submit those to Georgia DOT, and they send them over to Federal Highway. Then they will come back to us with an authorization to enter into a contract. So we anticipate sometime perhaps in September, early September, to get that authorization to enter into the contract and be able to put it on the agenda for consideration by the board. It may be later in the month, uh, which would then put it into the October time frame to be before the board. All right, so we're saying fourth quarter, award the contract, notice to receive. Correct. All right, that, that's fine. It, we're okay. October, so again, fourth quarter, October 2022 proceed. Uh, and how long do we anticipate this would take? Because uh, I'm, I'm thinking for more for the consumers. I got what you just shared was in, <laughs> internal for the Board of Commissioners. But what about um, setting the public's expectations? What are we saying? We, we would anticipate if the schedule goes as, as it seems now, uh, that there may be some utility work that commences towards the end of the year. Uh, but essentially, it will be 2021 and 2022. It is a two-year project. Two it, it, we anticipate it will take two years between relocation of the utilities and physical construction to completion. Uh, so there could be some minor utility relocation towards the end of the year perhaps late November, December, but in all likelihood, uh, most of the construction will begin in January of 2021. January 2021, two year process, and it's basically two and a half miles. That is correct. All right, so just, just for the public's sake, and for those who used um, that area as a cut through, uh, we're talking about it's gonna take about two years to benefit, um, that's both leaving and primarily coming back the other way um, and I just, I needed that for the record, Madam Chair. So, um, thank you. I'm good. Okay. Thank Madam, you, Miguel. All right. Um, Attorney Bernard, I believe Ma you have a comment. Madam Chair, if there's mm -hmm. no other on this item while Miguel is up, tomorrow we will be, with your permission, putting under new business an acquisition tied to a right-of-way. Because the number is so nominal, it's 3,750, I believe. <laughs> I, I'm going to avoid an executive session and getting everybody in a circle but it will be put under new business. You, you want to tell us the location, um, Miguel, just the, what project it's on? Yeah, this, this um, acquisition is uh, related to the Stuart Mill and Reynolds project. So that, yeah. that will be coming up. So that'll be under new business tomorrow with your permission, Madam Chair. I know we, yes. it's not on the consent agenda today, so we'll uh, avoid uh, executive session and then putting it on if you'll let us put us on put it on tomorrow because he does need to close it so be. yes so be we will uh, make an exception and move forward because of our circumstances that we're dealing with now okay thank okay you. we'll thank all you. right board of commissioners is there anything else to come before the board and before we close out again i want to urge the citizens of douglas county to adhere to all precautionary measures to mitigate transmission of the coronavirus uh, together we will get through this. Uh, however, compliance is important. I uh, urge you to be mindful of social distancing. Also, uh, make sure your hands are clean, your surfaces around you 
or you are making sure that you wipe those surfaces down and avoid crowds and just, uh, just uh, we're going to use basic common sense principles at this point and to remain calm. And uh, if all of us do our due diligence, uh, I am just uh, optimistic that we will get through this. Thank you so much and uh, Board of Commissioners. Um, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have a comment. Yeah, just one thing, uh, just just so everybody knows, our Madam Chair, we're confirming that our committees and everything will still continue on business as usual, correct? At this time, yes, we yeah, will yeah. continue on with our committees. Our committees, our committees are very way below 50, uh, certainly about five to six people in a room. But uh, things are changing by the moment. Every day the news is changing. So. Um, Right now, I'm just playing things by ear, but today our committee for the Finance Committee will um, be held at 2 o'clock in our boardroom. I think I, we have about five, five people in the room at a time, and there will be social distancing. If, oh, okay. if, is there anything else? Yeah, I just want to make my comment to that okay. point. Go All ahead. right, so to that point, um, both the Finance and Transportation Committees are, are moving forward. Um, today's Finance Committee, um, and this is acknowledged to the full Board of Commissioners, um, our terminus, our financial advisor, owed us a long-term capital plan. Uh, which would have been on the agenda today. I agreed with Madam Chair to pause it just temporarily, uh, but that information is available to the full board. The full board asked for a briefing on that. Um, and so we'll talk about it in our finance committee because in light of the current state of affairs, we just want to revisit it. And Madam Chair, I said we just bring it forth to the full board next month. Yes. If that's okay, yeah, or, or next meeting, et cetera. Uh, but of course, um, my peers, because you all asked for it, that information is available to you at any time. I yield the floor, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you so much. All right, with that being said, uh, if there's nothing else to come before this board or uh, this body, this meeting is adjourned. Good job. Good job.